Hello and welcome back to the Widow's Oil. This is part three of a series I'm doing, um, which focuses on what one should do when you find out false doctrine is being preached in your church, or perhaps if your faith is being shaken by something, maybe all the things happening in the world or all the questioning uh, that's happening regarding Christianity. How should we deal with that? Well, um, we've been looking at the story of Ruth to help us. And as you can see, yeah, I've got the, that little um, picture of the choice that Ruth had to make. She either had to go with um, Naomi to Bethlehem, which she'd never known because she was from Moab. That's all she knew. Or she she had to stay uh, where she was. Um, so I will link the part one and part two in the description box for you because um, it would be very wise to first watch those two before you listen to part three. In this part, we are going to look at the other daughter-in-law, Orpah, and, and her choice. Um, and what can we learn from that? Now, um, let us go and look at the meanings of certain words in the Esau. Um, firstly, let us look at the meaning of the name Orpah. And we could actually also look at the meaning of the name Ruth. But let us first look at this Orpah. If you look there, if you um, look at the, the root word, which we can see there, H6203, it says, from the nape or back of the neck, hence, the back, generally, whether literally or figuratively, back, stiff neck, or you could read stiff neck. That's very, very interesting. So if we look at the meaning of Ruth, that means friend. A female associate or additional one, a friend. Okay. So, the word, uh, the name Orpa, um, we see can be related to being stiff-necked. But before we look at that, let's just look first at the the two places, Bethlehem and Moab. Let's look at their meanings, because there it's also very interesting. Firstly, Bethlehem you probably know, means house of bread. And we learned in um, the part one video that Jesus, of course, is the bread of life. So Bethlehem is the house of bread. Um, and then we can look at Moab. What does that mean? Because um, Moab was the this, this son of Lot and his eldest daughter. Um, we read here, it is in Genesis 19, verse 36. So the oldest son was called Moab, um, and the younger one uh, from which the Ammonites came was Ben Ami. But we're looking today at Moab, since that's where Ruth came from. And she was a Moabitess, um, and she came from Moab. And yeah, of course, Moab means from her or the mother's father, which makes sense, from the mother's father. So you've got here yeah, the house of bread, and then you've got from the mother's father. Now, it's going to be very interesting how the name of um, Orpah actually ties in because we said that Orpah means stiff-necked. Now there is a scripture which um, Stephen spoke in Acts 7 
where it tells of how Stephen was stoned when he spoke the truth to the Jews regarding the rejection of Jesus Christ. And then he was subsequently stoned. Um, he said to them, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as, as your fathers did, so do you. So now remember, um, Orpah's name can mean stiff-necked or the neck. And so, yes, yeah, Stephen says, the stiff-necked um, is un uh, being uncircumcised in heart and ears, resisting the Holy Spirit because they can't hear, they can't spiritually see or hear. And it says, as your fathers did, so do you. So if you go back here to Moab, from the mother's father. So you've got two systems here that you are looking at. Um, and we're going to look in more detail uh, at this fact of being from the fathers. Um, but we, we see here the house of bread is set in contrast to um, a house which is of the fathers, of the mother's father. If we look here in Mark 7, we see here also Jesus speaking of this aspect of being of the fathers or the traditions of the fathers, um, where he said to the Pharisees and the scribes, you see, and he called them um, hypocrites and said Isaiah actually prophesied from them of them, saying that they only honor with their lips and everything that they do is a vain worship um, where their doctrines are actually commandments of men. The opposite of Bethlehem, which is the house of bread, Jesus being the bread of life. So their doctrines are not the bread of life. Their doctrines are the commandments of men, the ways of the fathers. So he says to them, he says they, um, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. And then he speaks of some of those traditions that they use and says making the word of God to no effect making it void through your traditions which you have handed down. So that is the other house, the house that is of the Father. And we've already looked in some of my previous videos at John 8, where Jesus um, tells the, the even those that believed in him, not just the Jews and the Pharisees that were against him, but even the, it says those Jews who believed on him, even they, he explained to them that there was Abram's seed and Satan's seed. You were either of your father, Abram, but now Abram is, the Abram seed is Christ. So we can say you're either of your father, Christ, or he said you are following the ways of your father. And he actually told them you're of your father, the devil. Um, so you can go and read yourself again this part in John 8. It's from verse 37 um, and exactly how the, you can read to the end of the chapter of how badly that went and how they turned against Jesus because he told them they if they if they were of Abram they would their fruit would show it. But now their fruit was showing that they were of their father, the devil. You are of your father, the devil. That's bad, said to them. So you see, again, it's those two. The father, the way of the father, and the way of Christ. So the choice is either Bethlehem or Moab. So Bethlehem would be a place 
or a person in which Christ dwells. It would be a place where a person would have the spirit of, of God dwelling in them or a fellowship or church where the gospel is being preached. That would be a house of bread, whereas Moab would re represent um, a false religion, a religion of traditions and doctrines that Jesus said there to them. Um, let's go look again at the, that uh, one where he spoke of their doctrines. Yeah, in Mark 7, we can see um, that Jesus said what is taught in Moab, spiritual Moab, doctrines, as doctrines, they teach the commandments of men or of the fathers. So that is why I am showing you this um, contrast. The gospel, the place where the gospel is preached and where the spirit of God is, the place where religion and doctrines of men are taught. Those are the two places that we must choose. And we, our the trial of our faith um, means that like Ruth and, and um, Orpah, we have to choose. Are we going with Christ or are we staying with the ways of our fathers? Now, if you look at Zechariah 1 verse 4, um, it also has a scripture which says, um, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me says the Lord. So yeah, uh, the prof that you can read the cross references, um, all of them that have to do with all the times the children of Israel were warned not to follow the ways of their fathers, the fruitless ways of their fathers, a stubborn and re rebellious gener generation whose heart was not loyal. You see, so they were not faithful. So yeah, in Revelation, we have that um, scripture that speaks of the 144,000 in Revelation 14. And it says, of them, these are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. And it says, they are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. What I believe spiritually that means is that they, um, they, they are not in re false religions. I think those women that defile them uh, is a, a spiritual symbolism for a false religion. Whereas following Christ and not spiritually getting married to some false religion, but following Christ wherever he goes until you are spiritually mature and able to spiritually join to Christ, that is what I think it could mean being a virgin and following the lamb wherever he goes. And that is what Naomi did. Ruth also did that. She chose right. Naomi, if you read the story, you'll see she and her husband came to Moab because of a famine. And we've said a famine spiritually also means a, a place where the, the, there's a spiritual famine for hearing the word of the Lord. And then she also actually left Moab. Um, she said, she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. So she, she left Bethlehem because there was no bread, came and lived in Moab in order to have bread, and then she, she went back to um, Bethlehem when the Lord gave bread there. So the Lord 
um, took care of um, Naomi and her family in Moab, physically and spiritually. Remember, the Lord was able to give the Israelites in the desert manner. So he spiritually took care of them there. And even in Moab, the Lord took care of them spiritually. But when the time came, um, when she needed um, to go back to the house of bread, she, she packed up and she left. So she also represents spiritually one of those that follow um, Christ wherever he, he goes. So if you look in Ruth again, you can see what happened to Orpah. Um, and we keep in mind Orpah now has to do with being stiff-necked or rebellious and clinging to the ways of your fathers. So Naomi tells Ruth, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. And if you think about it, it's actually very sad because um, Orpah was married to, to a Israelite man and yet she went back and she probably got married to a, a Moabite and had children who were Moabites. So she could have followed the way of Ruth. Ruth then um, went to Bethlehem, the house of bread, and there she had a little a baby, little Obed. Um, I said incorrectly in my first video that he was the father of David, but he was the, actually the grandfather. He had Jesse, and then Jesse was the father of David, and we all know Jesus Christ was born from that line. Now, yeah, I want to show you a short clip of a man who has reverted to Islam. They actually call themselves reverts when they are um, from Christian cultures and then they become a Islamic. Um, I think they call themselves that because Islam believes it to be the oldest of the faiths, but it is absolutely a false religion. And in a sense, the word revert is very bittersweet. And this is very sad. This is happening a lot um, at the moment. Um, and that is why I was warning you that when you see false doctrine and you start to search, when the Holy Spirit lets you search, you are going to come across um, Satan questioning every aspect of your faith. And that is why I said, firstly, hold fast to Jesus Christ above all. Um, and then hold fast to the scriptures. But you're going to need Jesus Christ more than anything. Because remember, the scriptures testify of him. So the rock to hold is your God. Hold fast. Um, this man, his his faith, he did he he didn't really he just came from a Christian background, and you'll see he had some experience. It's very common that people have some sort of experience, and then they they uh, follow this path where they fall into Islam, um, which is very sad to me, um, but. You're going to see here how his, his faith was shaken and he, he fell through. But Jesus promised us that if we belong to him and if we hold fast to him and if we guard his word, he said not one will fall to the ground. In regards to faith, what were you believing in? What type of problems did you see in Christianity and in the Bible that ultimately led you to Islam? I had a very interesting spiritual experience one day, which led me to seek out a spiritual path. And I chose Christianity 
there were problems. Uh, I noticed when I started to read the Bible, Jesus didn't preach Christianity. He didn't preach the incarnation. He didn't preach the Trinity. He didn't preach the atonement. And this is the scandal. Christians generally don't know about what their own scholars are saying about this. So he says when he started to read the Bible, he noticed problems in the Bible. And he said, he said, claim Jesus didn't preach Christianity, but Islam. He didn't preach the incarnation. He didn't preach the Trinity and he didn't preach the atonement. And then he says, this is now a scandal that is hidden. You will find so much of this um, preached on the internet. You'll find so much of this type of thing on the internet where teachings of Christianity are just absolutely thrown away. And so this is where the shaking of your faith can happen. Well, now let us have a look. You will see that that man, he decided to choose Christianity. Now, without the Holy Spirit guiding you, it's you you cannot understand the Bible. And Paul explains that. So we are going to have a look at 1 Corinthians 2, where Paul explains these things to us. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul explains that to the Corinthians, he only preached a very simple message, Christ and him crucified. Um, and he said he did that so that his faith would be um, in demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he didn't, uh, it, it was a, a simple message in demonstration of the spirit of uh, and of power in order that his faith should be in God, in the power of God, you see? So that's why I'm saying is hold fast to Jesus Christ. Let your faith be in the power of God and not in, in doctrines and the wisdom of men because then it can be shaken. But then he goes on to say, however, we speak wisdom among those that are mature. Now, if you watched um, part one, you'll remember I spoke in part one of how our problems lies um, with not even understanding the very first principles or milk doctrines of faith and repentance from dead works. Um, so you can go and look at part one if you want to know more of that. But for now, just remember that the, it, there's a process that we go through of maturing in our faith. And Paul says there, we do speak this wisdom uh, among those that are mature. So let's read there in 1 Corinthians 2 from verse 6. And I'm going to read right to the end of the chapter. It says there, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would have not crucify the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, 
but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things which have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And as I was reading this, I just found this very comforting that where, where Paul says here, yeah, he speaks of the wisdom of this age. Um, we speak wisdom among those that are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Now, it was the end of the age for Paul. They were looking forward to the rise of Christianity. Likewise, we are now at the end of another age where Christianity is being challenged. And it just comforts me to read, yeah, where he says the, the wisdom of the rulers of this age is coming to nothing. So all these that have stood up against Jesus Christ, as we speak, are coming to nothing because the Lord is going to make war with the fire of his mouth, with his word, the truth, and he's going to win this battle. But yeah, it tells us why the man couldn't understand the Bible. Paul says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things of which God has prepared for us who love him. And then it says a very important thing, but God has revealed them these things, these mysteries, these um, revelations. He has revealed them to us through his spirit. So Paul and Peter and James and that all those that followed Christ, he revealed these things through his spirit to them. And he can reveal them to us. But to do that, we must become mature, able to receive the Holy Spirit. Not to be stiff-necked and to, to withstand the Holy Spirit and then be carnal-minded. And to do that, we first need to have our milk doctrines. We need to understand why was Jesus Christ crucified? Why are dead works useless? Otherwise, we cannot receive these things. We keep thinking our works are acceptable. So that is why I say this process is a maturation and you need to be very humble if you are... Um, already a mature believer, and you receive this, it, the process will probably be faster. If you are a new believer, it's going to be very difficult, and you need to cling to Christ. Otherwise, all these temptations where Satan comes to you and asks you, did God really say this? Is the Bible really the word of God? You are going to be shaken out by those things. So don't go there yet. First, walk with Christ so that you can um, receive his Holy Spirit and so that the Holy Spirit can help you search the deep things and know the things um, of the Father. Because without the Spirit of God, you will never understand. Yea, it says here, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So when your mind is carnal, when it's not yet been transformed, then the things of the spirit seem foolishness. And you cannot judge the Bible. It says here, he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. The Bible is a spiritual book. And without the spirit of God, you cannot rightly judge the Bible. It will seem foolish and wrong to you. You could fall into 
works of the law fall back. So you cannot judge even the Bible correctly without the Spirit of God. You need the Spirit of God. Otherwise, you are going to fall back either into Hebrew roots or Islam, both which have another Jesus. Islam actually has a Jesus. Yeah, it says an important thing. We have the mind of Christ. And so Paul tells us about this mind of Christ because it just it's not just given to us. We can be carnal. Paul told the Corinthians because of all their divisions and strife about the doctrine that it shows that they were yet carnal in their thinking. And your carnal mind needs to be transformed. So in Romans 12, Paul explains this process. He says, therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Now, I won't go and look at the Esau, but that word transformed is actually the, you can go look up yourself. It is the Greek word which, from which we get the word metamorphosis. So like a worm becoming a butterfly, your, your mind must go from being carnal to being a spiritual mind. And that can only happen by the Holy Spirit, by submitting to God the Father as your Father who teaches you and trains you up so that you can come to Christ and that you can receive the Holy Spirit and that you can un understand the scripture. And that is why the Bible tells us in Revelation, hold fast to that which you have. I can summarize it all. I will summarize it by this scripture in Revelation 2.25, which says, hold fast until I come. Like Ruth, you must hold fast. And to end off, I will read two more verses which were written to the seven churches and that are in Revelation 3 that also speak of holding fast to the things you've received, to your, your heritage. Don't give away your heritage like Esau did, but hold fast. So... We have seen, we see on the screen, Revelation 2, verse 25, which tells us to hold fast. Then in Revelation 3, verse 3, we also read, Remember therefore how you have received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore you will not watch, I will come on you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. And then also, Revelation 3.11, which says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which you have, that no man take your crown.